and so in this video we're going to be continuing where we left off in the last video of The Fate of Ten by Pitticus Lore on oopsies, chapter three. Under ideal conditions, the walk to Union Square should take about 40 minutes. It's only a mile and a half, but these are far from idle conditions. Sam and I are backtracking along the same blocks we spent the afternoon fighting through, back to where the Mogadorian presence is heavier. Hopefully Nine and Five don't kill each other before we get there. We need them if we're going to have any shot at winning this war. Both of them. Sam and I stick to the shadows. Some blocks still have electricity, so the street lights are on, shining like it's a normal evening in the big city as if the roads altered... Of this, as if the roads aren't littered with overturned cars and broken chunks of pavement. We avoid those blocks, knowing it will be too easy for the mogs to spot us. We pass through what used to be, to, to be Chinatown. It looks like a tornado touched down here. The sidewalks are impassable on one side. An entire block's worth of buildings collapsed to rubble. There are hundreds of dead fish in the middle of the street. We have to pick our way carefully through the obstacles. On our way down from the UN, there are still people on nearly every block. The NYPD were trying to manage an elderly orderly evacuation, but most were fleeing haphazardly, just trying to stay ahead of the MOG squadrons that seemed equally likely to slaughter civilians as take them prisoner. Everyone was panicked and shell-shocked at their new horrific reality. Sam and I picked up the stragglers, the ones who didn't manage to leave quick enough or worse, or whose groups, groups got blown apart by MOG patrols. There were a lot of them. Now, after ten blocks, we haven't seen another living soul. Maybe most of the people in Lower Manhattan made it to the evacuation point on the Brooklyn Bridge. If the MOGs haven't attacked it by now. Anyway, I figure that anyone who managed to survive the day is smart enough to spend the night in hiding. As we sneak down the des next desolated block... Sam and, I skirt, Sam and I skirting cautiously around an abandoned ambulance, I hear whispering from a nearby alley. I put my hand on Sam's arm, and when we stop walking, the noise cuts off. I can tell we're being watched. What is it? Sam asks, his voice low. There's someone out there. Sam squints in the darkness. Let's keep going, he says after a few seconds. They don't want our help. It's hard for me to leave anyone behind, but Sam's right. Whoever's out there is doing perfectly fine in their hiding spot, and we'd only be putting them in more danger taking them with us. Five minutes later, we turn a corner and see our first Mogadorian patrol of the night. The Mogs are at the opposite end of the block, so we have the space to safely observe them. There are a dozen warriors, all carrying blasters. Above them, a skimmer hums along, sweeping the street with a spotlight mounted on the ship's underbelly. The patrol moves methodically down the block, a group of four warriors periodically breaking off from the rest of to enter darkened apartment buildings. I watch them go through this routine twice, and both times I breathe a sigh of relief when the warriors return without any human prisoners. What would happen if these mogs found a human in one of these buildings and pulled them screaming into the street? I couldn't just let that happen, right? I'd have to fight. What about... After Sam and I move on, they're predators. If we leave them alive, eventually they'll find prey. As I'm considering this, Sam nudges me, pointing towards a nearby alley that will lead us, of, that will let us avoid the mogs. Come on, he says quietly, before they get too close. I stay rooted in place, considering our odds. There are only twelve of them, plus the ship. I've fought bigger groups before and won. Granted, I'm still fatigued from an afternoon spent battling nonstop, but we'd have the element of surprise on our side. I could take down the skimmer before they even realize they're under attack, and the rest would fall easily. We can take them, I conclude. John, are you nuts? Sam asks, grabbing my shoulder. We can't fight every mog in, the new, in New York City. But we can fight the, these ones, I reply. I'm feeling stronger now, and if something goes wrong, I'll just heal us after. Assuming we don't, you know, get shot in the face and killed outright, battle to battle, healing us right after, how much of that can you take? I don't know. There's too many of them. We have to pick our battles. You're right, I admit grudgingly. We dart down the alley, hop a chain link fence, and emerge on the next block over, leaving the Mogadorian patrol to its hunting. Logically, I know Sam is right. I shouldn't be wasting my time with a dozen Mogs when there's a greater war to be won. After an exhausting day, I should be conserving my strength. I know all this is true. Even so, I can't help feeling like a coward for avoiding the fight. Sam points up at a sign for First Street and Second Avenue. Numbered streets. We're getting closer. They were fighting around 14th Street, but that was the la that was at least an hour ago. The way they were going at it, they could have gone in any direction from there. So let's keep our ears open for explosions and cre and creative cursing. Sam suggests. 
We'll only make it a few more blocks uptown before crossing paths with another Mogadorian patrol. Sam and I huddled behind a delivery truck, abandoned carts of fresh-baked bread still sitting on the off-loading ramp. I poked my head around the front of the truck, taking a head count. Once again, there are twelve warriors with a skimmer supporting them. This group behaves differently than the last one, though. The ship hovers in place, its spotlight fixed on the shattered front window of a bank. The mogs outside all have their blasters pointed into the building. Something has them spooked. I recount the pale heads glaring in the spot in the spotlight. Eleven. Only eleven were there. Only eleven were there. Only eleven were there were definitely twelve before. Only eleven where there were definitely twelve before. Did one of them just get ashed without me noticing? Come on, Sam says warily, probably thinking that I'm spoiling for a fight again. We should go while they're distracted. Hold up, I reply. Something's happening here. With the others cow covering them, two mogs stalk towards the front of the bank. They stay low, weapons at the ready, looking for something beyond the reach of the skimmer spotlight. When they reach the bank's threshold, both mogs toss their blasters into the air. The entire squad pauses, frozen, stunned by this development. It's telekinesis. Someone just disarmed those mogs with a legacy. I give Sam a wide-eyed look. Nine or five, I say. They're pinned down. Spurred to action, the rest of the mogs open fire on the darkness of the bank. The two disarmed warriors are lifted off their feet again by telekinesis and used as shields. They disintegrate in the flurry of their squad's blaster fire. Then a desk comes flying out from within the bank. Two mogs are crushed by the airborne furniture and the rest backpedal for better cover. Meanwhile, the skimmer maneuvers closer to the street, its guns coming around, angling for a shot inside the bank. I'll take the ship. You take the warriors, I say. Let's do it, Sam re replies, nodding once. I just hope it's not five hold up in there. I spring out from behind the truck and run toward the action, firing up my lumen as I go. The nerve endings in my hands feels fried. I can actually feel the heat from my own lumen, like I'm waving my hand over a candle. The pain is bearable, an obvious side effect of overdoing it today. I push through, quickly tossing a fireball at the skimmer. My first attack explodes their spotlight, darkening the street. The ship is knocked off course just as it unloads onto the bank. The heavy blaster fire curving chunks, carving chunks off the brick side of the building. With the main gun distracted, I hope to see nine charge out from the bank and... Join the fray. No one comes out. Maybe whichever guard is inside is injured. After a long day of fighting each other and the mogs, they're probably more worn out than me. I hear a sizzle of electricity behind me, Sam firing off his blaster, and watch as the two closest mogs go up in clouds of ash. Seeing us coming from behind, none of the mog tries to duck behind a parked car. Sam yanks him out from cover, out of cover with his newfound telekinesis and lights him up. One of the mogs screams a burst of gathering, of grading Mogadorian word, words into a communicator, probably radioing for help, broadcasting our location. That's not good. I bound up the hood of an SUV parked conveniently beneath the, skim, the skimmer. On my way, I lob a fireball at the mog with the communicator. He's engulfed by flames and is soon nothing more than ash pulled around some melted gear. Even so, the damage is done. They know we're here. We need to get out of here quick. I leap from the roof of the SUV, putting a huge dent into the metal as I push off. At the same time, I hit the skimmer with a telekinetic punch. I don't have the power to bring the ship down, but I hit it hard enough so that at one side of the saucer-shaped craft dips low towards me. I land right on top of the thing, two Mogadorian pilots staring at me in shock. A few weeks ago, it might have felt good to see the Mogs recoil in fear. I might have even said something funny, borrowed some quip from Nine's playbook before killing them. But now, after the terror they've unleashed on New York, I don't waste the breath. I tear the cockpit door loose from its hinges and send it flying into the night. The mogs try to unbuckle from their seats, groping for their blasters. Before they can do anything, I unleash a funnel of white hot, of white hot fire. The skimmer immediately begins to careen out of control. I leap free of the ship, landing hard on the sidewalk below, my, le my tired legs barely supporting me. The skimmer smashes into a storefront across the street and explodes, black smoke rising out from the store's shattered window. Sam runs up next to me, his blaster pointed at the ground. The rest of the area is clear of mogs for the moment. Twelve down. Twelve down. Like a hundred thousand left to go, Sam says dryly. One of them got off a distress call. We gotta go, I tell Sam. But even as I say this, I feel the same lightheadedness from earlier creeping on. The rush of battle gone. My fatigue is now back. I have to support myself on Sam's shoulders for a minute until I get my bearings. No one's come out of the bank, Sam says. I don't think it's nine in there, unless he's hurt. It's way too quiet. Five, I growl, moving cautiously towards the bank's and busted entrance. I'm not sure I can handle a fight with him at this point. My only hope is that Nine's done a good job of softening him up. There, Sam says, pointing into the darkened lobby. Someone's moving around. Whoever it is, they appear to have spent the battle hiding behind a sofa. Hey, it's all clear out here, I call into the bank, gritting my teeth as I shine my lumen inside. Nine? Five? 
It isn't one of the guard who cautiously steps into my beam of light. It's a girl. She's probably about our age, only a couple of inches shorter than me, with a lean sprinter's body. Her hair is pulled back in tight rows of braids. Her clothes are scuffed up, either from the fight or the general chaos, but otherwise looks up, she looks unhurt. Tossed over the girl's left shoulder is a heavy-looking duffel bag. She looks from Sam to me with wide brown eyes, eventually focusing on the light shining from the palm of my hand. You're him, the girl says, inching forward. You're the guy from TV. Now that the girl is close enough to see, I shut off my lumen. Don't want to be lighting up our location for the mob reinforcements that are on their way. I'm John, I tell her. John Smith. Yeah, I know, the girl says, nodding eagerly. I'm Daniela. You really killed the hell out of those aliens. Uh, thanks. Was there someone else in there with you? Sam cuts in, craning his neck to look past her. A dude with anger issues and a habit of taking off his shirt? A gross one-eyed guy? Daniela cocks her head at Sam, eyebrows raised. No, what? Why? We thought we saw someone attack those mugs, mugs with telekinesis, I say, looking Daniela over again, feeling equal parts curious and cautious. We've been tricked before by potential allies. You mean this? Daniela reaches over her head, and one of the dead mog, bl mogs blasters floats to her. She plucks it out of the air, resting it against the shoulder, not supporting her duffel bag. Uh-huh, that's a new development for me. I'm not the only one. Sam breathes, looking at me with wide eyes. My mind is cycling through possibilities so quickly that I'm struck, struck speechless. I might not have understood the why of it, but Sam getting legacies made sense to me on a gut level. He spent so much time around us, guard, done so much to help us. If any human was going to suddenly develop legacies, it would be him. The hours since the invasion have been so crazy that I didn't really have time to think about it. Didn't need to, really. Sam with legacies just seemed logical. When I imagine other humans being besides Sam getting legacies, I've been thinking of people we know, people who have helped us. I was thinking of Sarah most Mostly. Definitely not some random girl. This girl, though, Daniela, her having legacies means something bigger than I imagined was, has happened. Who is she? Why does she have powers? How many more like her are there? Meanwhile, Daniela is staring at me with that starstruck look again. So, um, can I ask why you picked me? Picked you? Yeah, to turn into a mutant? Daniela explains. I couldn't do this shit until today, when you and the pale guys... Magadorians, Sam clarifies. I couldn't move stuff with my mind until you and the Magadorkians showed up, Daniela finishes. What's the deal, man? None of the other people I've seen out here have powers. Sam clears his throat and raises his hand, but Daniela ignores him. She's on a roll now. Am I radioactive? What else can I do? You got those flashlight hands going on, and I'm going to be able... Am I going to be able to do that? Why me? Answer the last one first. I... I rub the back of my neck, overwhelmed. I have no idea why you. Oh, Daniela frowns, looking down at the ground. John, shouldn't we get moving? I nod when Sam reminds me of the impending Mogadorian reinforcements. We've already stood here talking for way too long, standing in front of me, and next to me, for that matter, are, what exactly? New members of the Guard? Humans? It's like nothing I've ever contemplated. I need to wrap my head around the new status quo quickly, because if there are more human Guard out here, they're going to be looking for guidance, and with all the C-Pan dead... Well, that leaves us, the Loric. First things first, I need to make sure Daniela stays with us. I need time to talk with her, to try figuring out what exactly triggered her legacies. It's not safe here. You should come with us, I tell her. Daniela looks around at the destruction that surrounds us. Is it going to be safe wherever you're going? No, obviously not. What John means is that this particular block is going to be crawling with Mogs any minute now. Sam explains. He starts walking away from the bank, trying to lead by example. Daniela doesn't follow, and so I don't either. Your sidekick's nervous, Daniela observes. My name's Sam. You're a nervous guy, Sam, Daniela replies, one hand on her cocked hip. She's staring at me again, sizing me up. If more of those aliens come, won't you just blow their asses away? I... I find myself having to recycle the pick-your-battles logic that made me bristle so much when Sam used it on me. There are too many to keep fighting. It might not feel like it now because you've just started using them, but our legacies aren't a limitless resource. We can push too hard, get tired, and then we're no use, no good to anyone. Good advice, Daniela says. She remains rooted in place. Too bad you couldn't answer any of my other questions. Look, I don't know why you have legacies, but it's an amazing thing. A good thing. It's destiny, maybe. You can help us win this war. Daniela snorts. Seriously? I'm not fighting any war, John Smith from Mars. I'm trying to survive out here. This is America, yo. The army will take care of these weak-ass dust aliens. They got the drop on us, that's all. 
I shake my head in disbelief. There's seriously no time to explain to Daniela everything she needs to know about the Mogadorians, their superior technology, their infiltration of Earth's governments, their endless amounts of disposable Vatborn warriors and monsters. I never had to explain those things to the other members of the Guard. We always knew the stakes, and we were... We were raised understanding our mission on Earth, but Daniela and the other newly minted guard who meant might be wandering around, what if they aren't ready to fight, or don't want to? An explosion shakes the ground under our feet. It emanates from a few blocks away, but it is still powerful enough to get set off, off car alarms and rattle my teeth. Thick smoke darker than the night sky floats into view from the north. It sounds like a building just collapsed. Seriously? Sam says. Something's headed our way. Another explosion, closer, confirms Sam's suspicion. I turn desperately to Daniela. We can help each other. We can help each other. We have to. Or we won't survive. I say, thinking not just of the three of us, but of humans and Lorik. We're looking for our friend. Once we find him, we're going to get out of Manhattan. We heard the government's established a safe zone around the Brooklyn Bridge. We'll go there, and... Daniela waves off my whole plan, stepping towards me. Her voice is raised, and I feel her telekinesis buff at my chest like a jabbing index finger. My stepdad got roasted by those pale scumbags, and now I'm out here looking for my mom, alien guy. She worked down here. You saying I should drop all that and join your army of two, running around my city that you played a part in getting blown up? You saying the friend you're looking for is more important than my mom? Another explosion, closer still. I have no idea what to say to Daniela, that yes, saving Earth is more important than saving her mom. Is that my recruitment speech? Would I have listened to that if someone said it about Henry or Sarah? Oh my god. Sam says, exasperated. Could we at least agree to all run in the same direction? And that's when the reinforcements come into view. It isn't a squadron of skimmers or warriors come to kill us. It's the Anubis. Chapter 4. The massive warship, bigger than an aircraft carrier, becomes visible in the night sky when it's still five or so blocks away. It, pulls, it pushes slowly through the acrid smoke. Its recent bombings kicked up. Sam and I have been able to stay ahead of the Anubis earlier that afternoon, fighting our way south as it slowly prowled the skyline to the east. But now, here it is, looming up the avenue, right in the direction of Union Square. I clench my fist. Satrekis, Ra, and Ella are on board the Anubis. If I could just get on there, maybe I could fight my way to the Mogadorian leader. Maybe I could kill him this time. Sam stands at my side. Whatever, whatever you're thinking, it's a bad idea. We need to run, John. And as if, as if to punctuate Sam's de declaration, a, sizing, a sizzling ball of electricity, electric energy gathers in the barrel of the Anubis' huge hull-mounted hull -mounted cannon. It's like a miniature sun building up within the barrel. And for a moment, it lights the surrounding blocks in a ghostly blue. Then, with a sound like a thousand mog blasters going off at once, the energy erupts from the cannon, shearing through the facade of a, the facade, facade, whatever, of a nearby office building. The 20-story structure almost immediately collapsing inwards. A wave of dust rolls down the street towards us, coughing. The three of us have to shield our eyes. The dust might give us some cover, but that doesn't really matter when the warship has a gun that can demolish whole buildings. The Anubis lumbers lumbers closer, already preparing for another shot. I'm not sure if Satrekis Ra is aiming at heat signatures in the buildings or if he's just destroying things at random, hoping to hit us. It doesn't matter. The Anubis is like a force of nature, and it's headed in our direction. Hell with this, I hear Daniela say, and then she takes off. Sam follows her, and so do I. The three of us retreating the, same, the way Sam and I just came from. We'll have to find another way to track down Nine. If he's still in the area, I hope he manages to ride out this bombing. Do you know where you're going? Sam yells to Daniela. What? You guys are following me now? You know the city, don't you? Another building explodes behind us. The dust is thicker this time, choking, and my back gets pelted by small chunks of plaster and cement. The explosions are too close. We might not be able to outrun the next one. We need to get off the street, I shout. This way, Daniela yells, hooking a sharp left that momentarily takes us out of the deluge of building debris that funnels down the avenue. When Daniela turns, something lip slips loose from under the broken zipper on her duffel bag. For a split second, my eyes track a hundred dollar bill as it floats through the air and is quickly swallowed by the, billo by the billowing clouds of debris. Weird that what you notice when you're running for your life. Wait, what exactly was she doing in that bank when the mogs pinned her down? There's no time to ask. Another explosion rocks the area. This one definitely deafeningly close and strong enough that it knocks Sam off his feet. I drag him back up and we scramble onwards, both of us covered in the clinging, choking dust of the destroyed buildings. Even though Danielle is just a few yards ahead, she's only visible as a silhouette. In here! She yells back to us. I try to shine my lumen ahead, but it doesn't do much good in the swirling building fragments. I have no idea where Danielle, Danielle is leading us, not until the ground disappears from beneath my feet and I fall head first into a hole in the ground. Oof! Sam yelps as he hits the concrete next 
floor next to me. Danielle is on her feet a few yards away. My hands and knees are scraped from the landing, but otherwise I'm unhurt. I glance over my shoulder, seeing a darkened staircase that's rapidly filling in with debris from above. We're in a subway station. A little warning would have been good. I snap at Daniela. You said off the street, she replies. This is off the street. You okay? I ask Sam, helping him up. He nods, catching his breath. The subway station begins to vibrate. The metal turn turnstiles rattle and more dust filters down from the ceiling even through the barrier of concrete i hear the mighty growl of the warship's engines the anubis must be right above us electric blue light pours into the station from outside go i yell shoving sam danielle already hopping a turnstile into the tunnels the cannon unloads with a high-pitched shriek even shielded by layers of concrete i tingle from the electricity my body fizzing down to its bones the subway station shakes and above us a building lets out a mournful groan as its steel grinding twists and collapses. I turn and run, jumping onto the tracks after Sam and Daniela. I look over my shoulder as the ceiling starts to cave in, first sealing off the stairs we just fell down, then spreading farther into the station. It isn't going to hold. Run! I yell again, straining to be heard over the crumbling architecture. Into the darkness of the subway tunnel we sprint. I fire up my lumen so that we can see, my light glinting off the steel tracks on either side of us. I sense movement at my side, and it takes a moment to realize that there's a herd of rats running alongside us, also fleeing the collapse. Somewhere down here, a pipe must have burst because I'm running through ankle-deep water. But with my, in my enhanced hearing, I listen to the stonework that surrounds us grinding and tearing. Whatever the Anubis destroyed on the street level, it caused major damage to the foundation of the city. I glance at the ceiling just in time to see a jagged crack spread through the cement, breaking off into tributaries that spread down the mold-covered walls. It's like we're trying to outrun the structural damage. We can't win this race. The tunnel's going to collapse. I'm about to yell out a warning when the tunnel gives way above Daniela. She only has time to look up and scream as a dislodged chunk of cement plummets towards her. I put everything into my telekinesis and shove it, shove it upwards. It holds. I manage to stave off the cave in centimeters from Daniela's head. I exert so much constant counterforce to support the massive weight overhead that I'm pushed down to my knees. I feel the veins in my neck protruding, fresh sweat dampening my back. It's like carrying a tremendous weight when you're already exhausted, and meanwhile, new cracks are spiderwebbing out from the broken piece of ceiling. It's physics. The weight has to go somewhere, and that... Somewhere is going to be right on top of us. I can't hold this, not for long. I taste blood in my mouth and realize I'm biting my lip. I can't even yell to the others for help. If I shift even a tiny bit of focus away from my telekinesis, the weight will become too much. Luckily, Sam realizes what's happening. We have to hold up the ceiling, he shouts at Daniela. We have to help him. Sam stands next to me and throws his hands up. I feel his telekinetic strength join mine and it alleviates alleviate some of the pressure. I'm able to get up from my knees. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Daniela hesitate. The truth is, if she ran now with Sam and me supporting the tunnel, she could probably make it to safety. We'd be screwed, but she'd make it. Daniela doesn't run. She stands on the other side of me and pushes up. The cement in the ceiling groans and more cracks erupt in the tunnel walls. It's a delicate balance. Our telekinesis just forces the weight from the broken stonework to shift elsewhere. No matter what we do, eventually this tunnel is going to collapse. Enough of its weight has been taken off that I can speak again. I ignore the burning agony in my muscles, the heaviness sinking in my shoulders. Sam and Daniela are to holding, waiting for my instructions. Walk. Walk backwards, I manage to grunt. Let it go, slowly. Shoulder to shoulder, the three of us march slowly backwards down the tunnel. We keep the telekinetic pressure on directly above us, gradually letting go of the sections of ceiling that we're, we've safely passed under. It rumbles and collapses in our wake. At one point, I see a couple of cars fall into the tunnel, quickly swallowed by more debris. The street above is collapsing, but the street of a, the three of us manage to hold it at bay. How long? Sam asks through gritted teeth. Don't know, I reply. Keep going. Shit! Daniela repeats over and over, her voice a hoarse whisper. I can see her arms shaking. Both she, and Sam, both she and Sam are raw, not used to telekinesis. I've never supported this much weight before, and I certainly didn't come close to it on my first day with legacies. I can feel their strength waning, beginning to slip. They just need to hold on a bit, a little bit longer. If they don't, we're dead. We're going to make it, I growl. Keep going! I can feel the subway tunnel gradually sloping downwards under my feet. The deeper we get, the sturdier the ceiling is above us. Step by step, the telekinetic counterpressure we need to exert lessens until finally we reach a section of tunnel where the ceiling is stable. Let go, I groan. It's okay, let go. 
As one, we release our hold on the ceiling. Ten yards away, the last bit of ceiling we'd been supporting crashes into the tunnel, blocking off the way we came. Above us, the tunnel creaks and holds. All three of us collapse into the filthy water that fills the bottom of the tunnel. I feel as if an actual weight has been lifted from my shoulders. I reach... I hear a retching noise next to me and realize that Danielle is throwing up. I try to stand up to help her, but my body doesn't cooperate. I fall face first into the water. A second later, Sam's hands are under my arms, lifting me up. His face is pale and strained, like he doesn't have much left to give. Oh man, is he dying? Daniela asks Sam. However much ceiling we were holding, he was probably carrying four times as much. Sam replies, help me with him. Daniela slides underneath my other arm. She and Sam lift me up, dragging me down the tunnel. He just saved my life, Daniela says, still, br still breathless. Yeah, he does that kind of thing, a lot. Sam turns his head, speaking into my ear. John, can you hear me? Can you shut off the lights? We can make it in the dark for a bit. That's when I realize that I'm still illuminating the tunnel with my lumen, running on fumes and still I'm instinctively keeping the lights on. It takes a conscious effort on my part to let my lumen go out, to not fight against my own exhaustion, to allow myself to be carried. I let go, trust in Sam. And then I can no longer feel Sam and Danielle's arms around me. I can't feel my feet dragging through the thick slop of the subway tunnels. All my aches and pains melt away until I'm peacefully floating through darkness. A girl's voice interrupts my rest. John? A cold hand slips inside mine. It's slender and girlish, fragile, but it squeezes with enough force to bring me back to my senses. Open your eyes, John. I do as she says and find myself stretched out on an operating table in an astute... Astier room, an array of ominous-looking surgical machinery spread out around me. Right next to my head is a machine that looks almost like a vacuum cleaner. A suction tube with a scalpel sharp, with a with scalpel sharp teeth at its end is attached to a barrel filled with a vicious, writhing black substance. The ooze floating through the machine reminds me of the stuff I cleansed from the Secretary of Defense's veins. Just looking at it makes my skin crawl. It's inherently unnatural and Mogadorian. This isn't right. Where am I? We're we're. Were we captured while I was unconscious? I can't feel my arms or my legs, and yet, strangely, I don't panic. For some reason, I don't feel like I'm in any real danger. I've had this kind of out-of-body experience before. I'm in a daze, I realize, but not my own dream. Someone else is controlling this. With some effort, I manage to turn my head to the left. There isn't anything in that direction except more bizarre-looking equipment, a mixture of stainless steel, medical tools, and complicated machinery like the stuff we found inside Ashwood Estates. On the far wall, though, there's a window. A porthole, really. We're in the air, the sky dark outside, lit only by the fires in the city below. I'm on board the Anubis, floating above New York City. Trying to take in every detail, I turn my head to the right. A team of Montegadorians dressed in lab coats and wearing sterilized gloves huddle around a metal table exactly like the one I'm laid out on. There's a small body on the table. One of the mogs holds the tube from another of the those ooze machines in the process of pressing it into the sternum of the young girl on the table, Ella. She doesn't cry out when the blades on the hose pierce her chest. I'm powerless to do anything as the black Magadorian goo is slowly pumped into her. I want to scream. Before I can, Ella turns her head and locks eyes with me. John. John, she says, her voice totally calm despite the gruesome surgery being performed on her. Get up. We don't have much time. Chapter 5 We can do this, but first, you need to understand how pure... Oh, blah, 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 wrong, 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 all wrong. We can do this, but first, you need to understand how Pira Dunra thinks, Adam whispers. You are the expert on mog psychology, I reply, watching as Adam uses a broken branch to draw a square in the dirt. Enlighten us. Three of us crouch next to our lifeless skimmer on the dirt strip the mogs were using to as, as a runway. It's dark now, but the mogs had plenty of handheld electric lanterns on hand to illuminate their round-the-clock attempts to break into the sanctuary. I guess Fira didn't have the foresight to steal all the batteries, so at least we've got light. There are also some huge floodlights positioned around the temple's perimeter, but we've left those off. No need to make spying on us any easier for her. The jungle around us seems louder now that the sun's gone down, the chirping of tropical birds replaced by the shrill buzzing of billions of mosquitoes. I slap the back of my neck as one of them tries to bite me. There's no doubt in my mind that she's out there now watching us, Adam says. Every mog warrior of her class is trained in surveillance. Yeah, we know. I reply, glancing out into the darkness. You guys have been stalking us all our lives, remember? Adam continues ignoring me. 
She's probably capable of going at least three days with no sleep, and she won't remain in one place. She'll stay mobile. There won't be a campsite to find or anything like that. If we go in there after her, she'll move. Stay ahead of us. She's got a lot of jungle to hide in. That said, it'll be her instinct to stay close. She'll want to keep tabs on us. Marina frowns at Adam, watching as he draws some squishy lines in the dirt around his square. I realize that he's drawing sanctuary and the surrounding jungle. So we have to draw her out, Marina says. <clears throat> you know a good way to do that? Uh, you know a good way ugh, you know a good way to do that? I ask Adam. We give her something no mog can resist. Adam replies, and he draws an M in the western part of the jungle. Then he gives Marina a pointed look. A vol a vulnerable guard. Immediately, I feel the air around us get a little colder. Marina leans forward, getting close to Adam, her eyes narrowed threateningly. Do I seem vulnerable to you, Adam? Of course not. We just want you to appear that way. A trap, I say, trying to mediate. Marina, chill out. Marina gives me a look, but I feel her icy aura dissipate. So, Adam continues, first, we split up. Split up, Marina repeats. You're kidding. That's always the worst idea, I say. We can just go out there and hunt her down. Oh, we can just go out there and hunt her down, Marina says. Six can make us invisible. She won't have a chance. That could take all night, Adam says. Maybe longer. And it's not exactly easy moving through a dark-ass jungle, I remind Marina, thinking back to our journey through the Everglades. <clears throat> we split up because it's a dumb move, Adam explains. We make it look like we're trying to find her, like we're trying to cover more ground. Pira Dunra will see it as an opportunity. Adam draws three lines moving away from the temple, fanning out in the jungle. Six, you'll go east. I'll go south. Marina, you'll go west. Adam looks at me. When you get 200 paces into the jungle six, you turn invisible. She won't be watching you at that point. What makes you think she won't attack me? I ask. I can be vulnerable. Marina snorts. Adam shakes his head. She'll go after our healer first. I know it. Because it's what you would do? Marina asks. Adam meets her eyes. Yeah. Marina and I exchange a look. At least Adam's being straight up about how he'd hunt us down. I'm glad he's on our side. I guess it makes sense, Marina says, examining the drawings in the dirt. Suddenly, she looks back up at Adam. Wait. You're saying the Mogs know I'm a healer? Of course, he replies. Any legacies they've observed in the field have become part of your, do your dossiers. <laughs> and all Mogs study those. It's like their second favorite leisure activity after the great book. Fun, I say. Marina considers this. They wouldn't know about my night vision. It's not something they could observe. Adam looks up from his battle plan. You have night vision? Marina nods. If you're right, and Fira does attack me, I might actually see her coming first. Huh, Adam replies. Well, that's a bonus. So what do I do after I turn invisible, I ask. You find me, we go invisible, and then we double back and follow Marina. Back her up for when Pira Dunra attacks. And if she attacks me before you guys get there? Marina asks. Adam smirks. I guess try not to kill her until you've gotten back the conduits. Do you think she's going to just hand them over? Marina asks, cocking her head at Adam. Hopefully, she's carrying them on her, he replies. And if she's not? I. Adam looks from Marina to me, trying to gauge our reactions. There are ways to make people talk, even Mogadorians. We don't torture, Marina says empathetically. Even after everything she's been through, even after losing eight, she's still the moral compass. She looks over at me for support. Right, Six? We'll figure it out, I reply, not wanting to take a position at the moment. First things first, let's get the bitch. The three of us make a big show of separating, each of us carrying one of the electric lanterns into the forbidding jungle. As I duck through the thick vines and claw-like and claw like branches in the dense brush, I focus my hearing as much as possible. I'm hoping maybe I'll stumble upon Pira, shorten this whole plan Adam hatched, but no such luck. I'm only successful in amplifying the ceaseless sounds of the jungle. On my left, something dark and furry shrieks out a warning as I move through its territory. 
that there's so much movement and noise out here, Adam was right. It'd be next to impossible to track Fira Dunra. I push aside a branch with more force than necessary. It snaps back and slaps my shoulder. I grip my teeth and wonder if I could just call a hurricane down on this whole junk, stupid jungle and pick up Pira Dunra. One Mog. We're out here chasing one stupid Mog. This must be exactly what Pira Dunra wanted. To take us out of the game while who the hell knows what happens back in New York. A full-scale invasion could be underway. I imagine John and Nine trying to fight off hordes of Mogadorians. Sam running for his life. The entire world engulfed in flames. Yeah, we need to hurry this up. Before splitting up and heading into the jungle, we turned on the large halogen work lights around the sanctuary's perimeter so we'd be able to find our way back. Once I've gone far enough that I can barely see the lights through the trees, I turn invisible. Just in case Pira Dunro is watching me instead of Marina, I use my telekinesis to float my lantern ahead of me. I wait a few seconds to see if any shadows, shadowy forms detach from the surrounding jungle to pursue my ghostly lantern, and when none do, I hook the lantern to a low-hanging branch and leave it behind. I'm comfortable with my own invisibility, having developed a good sense of spatial awareness after years of practice. Still, it isn't easy navigating without my light. At least I've got some experience b from back in Florida. I take it slow, glancing often at muddy ground in front of me, ducking low to go under branches. At one point, I have to carefully step over a stripped, a striped rattlesnake, the thing not even shifting as I pass by. Before long, I spot Adam's lantern bobbing through the jungle. He's moving purpose, pur purposely slow, waiting for me to catch up to him. He doesn't hear me coming. When I slip my hand into his in the moment before I turn him invisible, I hear his breath catch and shoulders tense. Scare you? I whisper to him. I pluck the lantern out of his other hand with my telekinesis going through the same routine that I did with my own. Surprised me, that's, oh, surprised me, that's all. He replies quietly. Let's go. We start picking our way through the jungle towards where Marina should be. I'm careful not to go too fast at first, but Adam has good balance and seems to be keeping up just fine. His hand is surprisingly cool and dry despite the, hu the humid jungle air. He's steady. This whole situation isn't weird to him at all. I can't help but breathe out a little laugh. What? He asks me, his voice a whisper in the darkness. Just never imagined, just never imagined reaching a point in my life where I'd be holding hands with a Mogadorian, I reply. We're allies, Adam responds. It's for the mission. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up. Still, it isn't weird for you. Adam pauses. Not really. Adam doesn't say anything more. I remember something he said back on the flight to the sanctuary. Who do I remind you of? I ask him as we carefully climb over a fallen log. What? Back in the skimmer, you said I reminded you of someone. You want to talk about that now? He whispers back. I'm curious, I reply, keeping an eye out for the telltale glow of Marina's lantern. We don't see it yet. Adam is quiet for long enough that I start to think he's just done talking, like his silence is a reprimand for not staying on mission. I'm about to tell him that I can successfully track one Mogadorian while also carrying on a small talk. Thank you very much, when he finally answers me. Number one, he says. That's who you remind me of. One, the guard you took your legacies from? His hand tenses up in mine, like he has to stop himself from yanking away. She gave her legacy to me, Adam snaps. I didn't take anything. All right, I reply. Sorry, poor choice of words. I didn't realize that you actually got to know her. We had a complex relationship. Like you were in charge of the Mog stalking her or something? Adam sighs. No, after she was killed. One's consciousness was implanted in my brain alongside my own. For a while, basically, we shared a body. I guess that's why I'm not concerned with holding hands or whatever juvenile thing has been making you uncomfortable for the last five minutes. I've been really, really close to guard before. Now it's my turn to fall silent. I never even met number one. She remains a complete mystery to me, more like a concept, the unlucky one. First up to bat, the first one to get killed, and yet Adam has all this intimate knowledge of her. It's weird to think that Amagadorian has given more thought to number one than I ever did. Not just that, but it sounds like he actually cared about her. Our world just gets stranger and stranger. There she is, I whisper, sparing us any further awkward conversation as Marina's lantern comes into view. Good, Adam says, sounding relieved. Now we follow along and wait for Pira Dunra to take the bait. Adam's interrupted by a cobalt blue blaster fire sizzling through the air, aimed right for Marina's lantern. Even with all the jungle noise, I hear Marina scream. I can hear Marina scream. Shit, go! 
I release Adam's hand and sprint through the jungle, using my telekinesis to shove aside the tangled branches and dense blockades of leaves. I'm sure I pick up a few scratches along the way, but that doesn't matter. The, cre the creature sounds around me become loud with panic as I trample through their territories. I'm distantly aware of Adam running behind me, taking advantage of the path I'm clearing. Up ahead, I can tell that Marina's lantern has fallen to the ground by the way it throws crooked beams of light through the twisted tree limbs. Running full throttle, it takes me less than a minute to knife my way through the jungle. I burst into the small clearing where Marina's lantern is on the ground, just in time to see Marina running her hand over a blaster burn on her upper arm. She glances up at me as she heals the, bl the blistered flesh. Plan worked, Marina says casually. You're hurt, I reply. This? Lucky shot. I breathe a sigh of relief, then look to Marina's left, where Pira Dunra glares at us from her, her knees. There's a fresh trail of blood dripping through her mess of mog tattoos and severely pulled back braids, probably from where Marina clocked her. Pira's blaster is in the dirt next to her, out of reach and crumpled beyond use by a telekinetic attack. Her hands and ankles are bound in what I quickly realize to be shackles made from solid ice. Looks like Marina's getting pretty good with her new, her new legacy. Adam arrives in the clearing a few seconds after me. Pira Dunra's look of hatred only intensifies when he shows up. You got her, Adam says, and Marina nods. Even smiles a little. You're all right? I'm good, Marina replies. Now what should we do with her? You should kill me. Pira Dunra growls, spitting into the dirt in front of her. The sight of a trueborn consorting with the Lorg, with you Lorg trash, so offends my eyes I no longer wish to live. Hello to you too, Pira. Adam says, rolling his eyes. What did you do to my chimera? Pira Dunra's eyes light up. A little trick I learned from the Plum Island scientist with blaster frequencies. Did your pet die? I didn't even have time to check its body. He survived, unlike you. We aren't going to kill you, I start to say, but Pira thrashes in the dirt, interrupting me. Because you're cowards, she hisses. Do you want to rehabilitate me like this one? Make me into another Mogadorian pet? It won't happen. You didn't let me finish, I say, stepping closer to her. We're not going to kill you yet. Did you search her? Did you search her? Adam asks Marina. She was only carrying the blaster, Marina replies. The rest of Fira's outfit is the standard sleek body armor of a Mog warrior. There's no room to hide a bunch of ship parts. Where are the conduits? Give them back, and I'll at least make your death quick. Marina shoots me a quick look, her eyebrows upraised. I put off answering those questions before. What do we do with a captured Mogadorian, and how far do we go to get what we need? Torture. The thought gives me a chill of revulsion, especially thinking back to my time spent being one of their captives. It feels like crossing a line, like something they would do to us. It's different from killing them in battle, when they're fighting back and trying to kill us, too. Fira Dunra is helpless, our prisoner, but one Mog prisoner is useless, and we need to get the hell out of this jungle. I know we shouldn't sink to their level, but our situation is desperate. How far will threats take us, I wonder? Die a slow death, Lorik scum. Pira spits back at me. So, she isn't going to make this easy. Before I can decide what to do, Adam darts past me and strikes Fira across the face with the back of his hand. She cries out and topples over onto her side. Pira is stunned, I realize. She wasn't expecting the blow. Maybe she was banking on the fact that Marina and I wouldn't have the stomach for torture. Adam, on the other hand. You forget who you're dealing with, Pira Dunra. Adam says through clenched teeth. He slides onto his knees in the dirt next to her and grabs her by the front of her shirt, yanking her partially upright. Do you think because I've sent time with the guard that I've forgotten our ways? You know who my father was. Much to his disappointment, my marks were always highest in the non-combat related subjects. But still, the general found ways to focus my training, interrogation, anatomy. Imagine how rigorously the general trained his heir. I remember well. Adam reaches one of his hands around Pira's head, digging his thumb into the space between her ear. She screams out, her legs thrashing. Marina takes a step towards the two mogs, giving me another look. I swallow hard and shake my head, stopping her. I'm going to let this play out, whatever, wherever it leads. I might not share your ideology, Pira Dunra, Adam says, raising his voice to be heard over her screaming. But I do share your biology. I know where your nerves are, where to hurt you best. I will spend the rest of the night picking you apart until you beg for disintegration. 
Adam releases his grip on Pira, letting her fall back into the dirt. She's panting, struggling to get in a deep breath. Or you can tell us where you hid the conduits, Adam says calmly. Now. I'll never... Fear is cut off, flinching as Adam stands up. He has suddenly lost interest in her. He saw the same thing I did, the way Fira Dunra's eyes flick towards a moss-covered log at the edge of the clearing. Adam walks over to the log while she squirms around in the dirt, trying to keep her eyes on him. On closer inspection, the log is rotted, hollowed out by termites. Adam plunges his hand inside and tugs out a small duffel bag. Fira must have shoved the bag in there before attacking Marina. Aha! he says, giving the bag a good shake. Inside, metal parts cling together. Thanks for your help. Marina, Marina and I exchange a relieved look, even as Pira screeches out her la latest taunt. It doesn't matter, traitor, she says. Nothing you do matters anymore. That gets my attention. I give Pira a not-so-gentle kick in the back to make her roll over and look at me. What does that mean? I ask her. What are you saying? War came and went, Pira replies, laughing at me. Earth is already ours. My stomach drops at the thought, but I don't let it show. We have to get out of Mexico and see for ourselves. Are the parts intact? I ask Adam. She's lying to you. She's lying to you, Six. It, it's what she does. He reassures me, maybe detecting a tremor of nervousness in my voice. He tosses down the duffel bag and crouches over it. What should we do with her? Marina asks me. She focuses on Pira Dunra for a second, reinforcing the ice shackles that have begun to melt. I'm considering my answer when Adam grunts, yanking on the zipper that appears to be stuck on something. When the zipper comes loose, something inside the duffel bag clinks, like a timer being armed. Watch out! Adam screams as he shoves the bag away from him. Everything happens so fast. I see the ground rise up in front of the duffel bag and realize that Adam is using his seismic legacy to, sh to try shielding us. With an orange flash of light and a loud pop, the bomb inside the bag detonates right in front of him. Chunks of dirt and deadly shrapnel fly through the clearing. I'm thrown to the ground from the, con con the concussion blast. I can feel a fresh pain in my leg. A jagged piece of metal, probably ship parts, is lodged in my thigh. Above the ringing in my ears, I, hear I can hear Pira laughing hysterically. Okay, that was the end of Chapter 5. We'll pick up on Chapter 6 in the next video. I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. Alrighty, that's it for now. Until next time, guys. Reading by Rio. Bye!